Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Is this on? Yes. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the annual State of the City. My name is Drew Corbett. I am the city's assistant city manager and finance director. And I know that you're not here to see me. I'm just here to welcome you. But I would like to, without further ado, uh, introduce our distinguished mayor, the Honorable Rick Benia, who will be giving the presentation tonight. Thank you, everybody. No need to introduce myself. Thank you, Drew, very much. Uh, welcome. I want to thank all of you for being here tonight at the San Mateo 2018 State of the City Address. Um, I'm the mayor, Rick Bonilla. Um, thank you for coming to spend an hour with me while I'm explaining to you what we've been doing and what we're going to do going into the future. For those of you who don't know much about me, I've lived in San Mateo since 1991 with my wife, Suzanne. We live over in Hayward Park, uh, near the Central Park. Um, since being appointed and then elected to the City Council in 2015, I was re-elected in 2017, and I am now the mayor this year. I've been a strong voice in supporting families, neighborhoods, businesses, and workers in San Mateo. It's been my honor to serve as a council member and now as mayor. I want to recognize any city council members who may be here, although I think they got stuck in the traffic. I also want to mention our city staff. So tonight we have Kathy Kleinbaum, the deputy city manager. Yes, there she is. And we also have, I think, Steve Machida, the deputy director of the Public Works Department. We have George White, the director of the Community and Development Department. And I have these experts here, uh, along with some of their staff, because at the end we're going to have question and answer. And I want to make sure that uh, being an amateur at this and not really knowing all of the answers to all the questions in terms of all of the facts, if I get a question that requires some deeper dive, a little more attention, I'm going to have the ex-seasoned professionals uh, give you guys a good, decent response so we didn't, don't get any less than factual responses to anything. I have a presentation to share with you tonight because I have a lot of points to cover. I'm going to be a little measured in, in my, I have a lot of written, written material here. You're going to be able to see the slides. I'm going to put some meat on the bones of the slides. Uh, I want you to ask that you hold your questions until the end of the presentation. If you need to, jot them down, find something to write on, I hope. Um, at which time, there'll be plenty of time for question and answer. So I want to start right off talking about the budget. And as an overview, tonight, I'm going to provide an update on the financial overview of the city. I will review the notable accomplishments and what lies ahead in new initiatives and priorities for public safety, sustainability, parks and recreation, public policy, transportation and infrastructure, housing and development. And now, a few budget highlights. San Mateo's financial outlook is bright. San Mateo has long been recognized for being a fiscally fit and well-managed city. We have received several awards for excellence in accounting, and our budget is very well maintained. The city has experienced ongoing and steady growth of hotel and property tax revenues. These have driven the city's ability to contribute to our already healthy prudent reserve. Right now, we're in the second year of a two-year budget cycle. Our total budget is $293 plus million, of which $159 million is operations, and the other $134 million is capital improvement programs. And you're going to hear about a lot of capital improvement programs as I go through this. Uh, we have Measure S sales tax that the voters approved by 70% back in 2015. Measure X, uh, S uh, is a quarter cent sales tax. It was designed to fund infrastructure improvement and essential services. These are the things the voters voted for. And so now we're going to be appointing at the next council meeting on February 5th a publicly uh, uh, and we have some people here I see applied for the, uh, the committee. Measure S Oversight Committee is members of the public who are being appointed to make sure that the money is being used prudently and for the things that we said we would use it for. Measure S is estimated to generate $160 million over 30 years, and that'll be about $5 million per year. Police, fire, streets, park and recreation, and other essential services. Regarding our financial future, although San Mateo is a fiscally fit city, there are some financial challenges ahead. Like many cities, we have unfunded pension liabilities, which grow faster than revenues. To help close this gap, the city is now proactively paying down 
our unfunded pension liability by paying ahead. Making these payments now will help us save later, similar to when you prepay your mortgage or your car loan. We have competing demands for limited resources in San Mateo. For instance, there is a constant push and pull between, uh, for funding between critical infrastructure needs, such as street repairs and demands for enhanced community facilities or increased library hours. Thus, City Council must prioritize. Because we can do many things, but we can't do everything, we have to decide what are the most important things that need to be done for the people. For more information about the city's financial outlook and budget, I invite you to attend or watch online uh, the city's, uh, city council's meeting on next Monday, February 5th, starting at 7 p.m. You will see there that the assistant city manager and finance director, Drew Corbett, will give uh, a full presentation to the city regarding the current state of our budget. So, regarding notable accomplishments in terms of what's ahead, I want to share some of the city's successes over the last 12 months and describe what lies ahead in new initiatives as well as continuing priorities for 2018. On public safety, our accomplishments include, in 2017, we adopted and created the San Mateo Consolidated Fire Department, merged three fire departments, San Mateo, Belmont, and Foster City into one. The Joint Powers Authority will improve existing service levels and stabilize costs by sharing administration and training needs. The city purchased body-worn cameras for our police, which are an effective tool for our police department to demonstrate commitment to transparency, ensure accountability, and increase the public's trust. In protecting the general health and well-being of the community, the police department updated the city's smoking ordinance to regulate smoking of marijuana inside multifamily uh, residential dwellings as well as parks and public gathering spots. I don't know whether many people know, but it is indeed against the law to smoke anything at our public parks. So if you see that going on, all you have to do is call the police if you want to stop. They will respond. The Police Activities League engaged with over 7,000 youths through events, schools, outings, and outreach activities. And I have to say, I'm amazed at what Police Activities League does because these kids, they form a bond. They learn that these police, are, they're out there playing with them, playing sports, taking them fishing, going hiking, going skiing. They learn to be trust, they learn to trust the police and see them as their friends. It's one of the best things, investments we can make in our younger people and this city is really committed to that. In 2018, we'll continue the implementation of San Mateo's Consolidated Fire Joint Powers Authority. We'll start construction of Fire Station 25, enhancing services and response time from a central location in the city. The police department will launch Safe and Secure Neighborhood Initiative. The chief of police likes to call this Neighborhood Watch 2.0. The objective of the initiative is to ensure the highest quality of life for citizens by leveraging partnerships such as Neighborhood Watch, community alerts, and outreach. The initiative will also help prioritize the enforcement of neighborhood traffic issues. And finally, I joined forces with Chief Mannheimer to create a safe exchange zone. For people who buy things on the web, it'll protect your purchases by giving you a safe place to go. There will be a location in the police station's parking lot. It's well lit and there are cameras that will record everything that goes on there. And the chief and I agree that it's most likely that the crooks, the people who have been attacking and robbing and even murdering people while these exchanges are being made, will not go to the police station to do that. <laughs> so, so I think it's a great idea. In 2017, the following sustainability initiatives were accomplished. So as a board member of Peninsula Clean Energy, I am proud to say that we brilliantly launched the Peninsula Clean Energy Program in San Mateo County. We, were all getting, we are now all getting clean, renewable energy as a result. And I want to let you know how this went, okay? When it was time to form this board, every single city council member in all 20 cities in San Mateo County and the five members of the Board of Supervisors all voted unanimously to form this new Joint Powers Authority. And as a result, we are drastically and dramatically cutting our greenhouse gas emissions uh, that were previously done through our investor-owned utility, PG&E, who has much lower renewable standards. So we're really uh, uh, in the lead in terms of 
uh, cutting our carbon emissions through the electricity that we use. The cities, uh, additionally, I'm proud that San Mateo's municipal buildings and facilities now use 100% renewable energy. This library, 100% renewable energy. All of the city's facilities, 100%. The city's building reach codes went into effect this year, requiring mandatory solar and electrical vehicle readiness in all new construction, residential or commercial. We completed the LED street light conversion, making all of our streets safer at night. We amended our beekeeping regulations to a more bee-friendly policy for beekeepers in the city. Bees are really important. Very importantly, we joined 391 eco-friendly cities across the U.S to support the goals of the Paris Climate Accord. We did that with a resolution. In the next year, residents can look forward to an expanded bike share program and conversion of the existing bike share program to electric assist bikes. That'll be coming later in 2018, which means you don't have a throttle, but if you're pedaling and, and there starts being some uphill, it's gonna help you pedal. And you'll see these around at public places, in front of the library, by the train station, different spots. We're going to double the number of bikes, so you'll see more of them at different locations, too. We're exploring opportunities to expand the number of electrical vehicle chargers dispersed throughout the city. The city will be looking at opportunities to reduce dependence on natural gas, which continues to emit climate-damaging carbon. And we will initiate an update to the city's climate action plan which is taking us closer to the state-mandated goals that were uh, laid out in SB, uh, SB 325, I think. Anyway, those things that say that by 2025, we have to have certain levels and 2050 other higher levels of sustainability in terms of carbon emissions and all sorts of other things that we're, we're constantly working on. And we have a great uh, sustainability person in our office who is staying on top of these things. This year, uh, we started an environmental review of the Central Park Master Plan. Now we're on to parks. We also facilitated a workshop to gather community feedback on the Citywide Recreation Master Plan. The city purchased a mobile recreation vehicle, which will be staged at events to present all sorts of new recreational opportunities to young people or anybody else who shows up at the events. Uh, it'll be a, a great new thing to get the message out about what the city is doing for you at your public parks. We were thrilled to stage the Winter Wonderland in Central Park, and we contracted with San Mateo on Ice to operate the seasonal ice rink in Central Park for residents and visitors to enjoy. Almost every night that thing was just packed. The kids love it, everybody was out there. Um, I went out there several times to watch. The park is fun in the winter. City Council facilitated the opening of the Bridgepoint Ice Rink, and I want to give special recognition to Council Member Joe Gothels, who, though all of the Council Members and the Planning Commission stood firm on our reluctance to, to grant a land use change to the owner of that property when he wanted to change it to something else, um, Joe Gothels really went the extra mile. He went to bat. He went there and got the land, uh, the, the owner, the property owner, to really change the way he saw things. He backed off, and we were able to get that rink reopened. Young people are really appreciating that. And we also completed Poplar Creek Golf Course Alternative Study. The golf course is safe where it is for a number of years uh, into the future. We completed the renovation of the Laurie Meadows Park Playground. And we added 29 new community garden plots at the Los Prados Park. This year, Parks and Recreation Services will continue to work with residents to update the Central Park and Recreation Master Plan. These plans will shape, help shape the San Mateo community facilities, recreational facilities needs for the next 50 years. It's really critical. We need to make sure that we have top of the line opportunities for people to go out and recreate at our public parks. We'll be seeking public input regarding installation of a synthetic turf field at Martin Luther King Park, which is heavily impacted by rains in the winter and becomes unusable. I'm proud to announce Get Around, it's a pilot program to help seniors, San Mateo seniors, increase their mobility. We launched this just at the beginning of this month in 2018. Sarah Cab Company is the service provider. $5 for a ride for a senior to anywhere in San Mateo or our neighboring cities, Burlingame, Belmont, Foster City. $5 for a senior to get anywhere. Just call this, this uh, cab and you'll be able to get there. And if you need to find it, 
Um, we have 84 registrants already as the, at the time of the writing of my, my report here. And if you need to find it on the website, you go to San Mateo Rec, that's San Mateo Rec org, and you can use the search term senior transportation or sign up directly at the San Mateo Senior Center if you go by there. It's a great opportunity, and I encourage all the senior people to use it so that the pilot shows that there really is a high demand for this because I think it will help a lot of people get out and be able to do the things they need to do. Regarding public policy accomplishments, we completed a city website redesign. The website now is attractive, functional, and sleek, and I find it a lot easier to use. So I'm hoping other people do too. Previously, I had to use the search window a lot trying to find things, and you get 10,000 responses. Now, it seems pretty easy to get whatever you're looking for pretty quickly. This year, the council approved a welcoming city resolution, and we will continue to be an inclusive community and help newcomers with long-term economic and social integration. We're in the second year of San Mateo's minimum wage implementation. As of January 1st, the new wage in San Mateo, minimum wage in San Mateo is $13.50 per hour for private companies and $12 per hour for nonprofits. The plan is to reach $15 per hour by January 2019. In public policy in 2018, the city will continue to implement the minimum wage policy and offer assistance to neighboring cities who are now trying to adopt the minimum wage policy. Additionally, our staff will study the issues of wage theft violations with an eye toward protecting the wages of folks who work in San Mateo. Regarding transportation and infrastructure, in 2017, Public Works kicked off the construction at the 25th Avenue grade separation project, which includes grade separations at 25th, 28th, and 31st Avenues. Once completed, the project will help ease east-west traffic circulation and better connect the Bay Meadows neighborhood to El Camino, the mall, and the rest of the city. Our Highway 92 and El Camino interchange is close to completion, and what a great safety improvement that is. Already, the weaving that was going on when you got up onto Highway 92 has been eliminated. Although some of the actual entrances to the freeway are a little short, the project's not complete. They're going to straighten all that out. It will be much safer at the end of the project. Last year, we awarded repair of 1.8 miles of failed street repairs. Since 2014, we've replaced 5.2 miles of failed streets. Public Works has been working with neighborhoods to implement our traffic action plans throughout the city, and these, were, these plans were derived by a very open form, uh, uh, series of forums that were conducted in different neighborhoods to get input from the people who live in their neighborhoods, try to figure out what they really need where, and now it's actually being put into action. These uh, different uh, traffic calming devices, traffic cushions, uh, bulb outs, uh, the flashing pedestrian lights and so forth are being implemented throughout different parts of the city. It's gonna slow traffic down and make it safer for pedestrians and bicyclists to be able to get around. The clean water program is continuing to plan for necessary upgrades to the wastewater treatment plant and collection system. Just last week, I was in Washington, D.C. with council members Pappen and Frescott, lobbying the EPA for a low interest loan to help keep our sewer rates as low and affordable as possible. What's ahead for transportation and infrastructure? A lot. In the new year, the city will continue to work with the neighboring cities, counties, state, and federal governments to mitigate the regional traffic impacts that we all feel every day. We will continue to work examining the 101 managed lane proposal with Caltrans, and we will continue to seek grants to alleviate traffic congestion. For example, the city has been successful in lobbying the county and is on the short list for a $2 million grant to help mitigate traffic for the Highway 92 and 101 interchange project, a major bottleneck where we live, which forces cars off the freeway and onto our surface streets. It's one of the main reasons why we see the level of surface street congestion that we see. We will continue to work on the North Shoreview and North Central Neighborhood Flood Protection Project. We will continue to work on implementing our traffic action plans. We will continue replacement of 400 plus high voltage street lights with more efficient low voltage systems that will be LEDs and transmit plenty of light, keeping our streets uh, safe and sane out there uh, for pedestrians, bicyclists, and drivers. We'll fix four miles of failed streets this year. We will install twinkle lights, and I mean failed streets. These are streets that need major work. 
not streets that are going to just get a little scraping and a new surface on them. When I say fix failed streets, that's a major project. That's the streets that have the bumps and the, and the dips and the cracks. Those streets are being replaced, and we will have good quality streets there. We will install twinkle lights on B Street between 1st Avenue and 5th Avenue uh, downtown, and they will shine all year long. Some cities only light them up for the holidays. Uh, we have found in discussions with people that actually if you light the streets up like that, not only does it enhance the pedestrian experience, it makes the place feel more uh, uh, festive and it attracts more customers. People feel safe walking around where it's well lit. And finally, we'll pursue a no horn train quiet zone for at grade crossings in San Mateo. So where now the trains currently have to blow their horn under federal regulation. They have to blow their horns for safety every time they cross a street that's at the same grade as the train. They have to blow their horn then. They have to blow their horn at stations. But if we implement these new quiet zone projects, then there will be extra crossing protections that enable us to tell the, the uh, train operators that, no, you need to stop blowing your horns at these locations. We have 11 crossings in San Mateo. Some of them are grade separated, but right downtown, I think there are between 9th and, uh, well, between Hayward Park and the station at the north end of town. There are like six or seven different places where they have to blow their horns. We're going to eliminate at least five of those. So that'll make it a lot quieter at night when people are trying to sleep. In housing and development, we have the following accomplishments. The truth is that San Mateo is considered a very desirable place to locate, and it continues to be a hotbed of real estate activity on the peninsula. For example, 850,000 square feet of commercial development is currently under development. Much needed housing is being developed in response to the housing crisis that we are experiencing. One of our most recent successes is the approval of 68 all affordable units at Bay Meadows. In my belief, it is my belief that San Mateo understands the housing demands. We will seek to continue work on helping to resolve the region's housing and job imbalance by allowing the production of new housing units built close to public transit while simultaneously working to improve bridges, highways, and mass transit, thus relieving local congestion from our roadways. This year, we will start to envision what San Mateo will look like in 20 years with our General Plan 2040 update. The Council will select the development team for the city-owned land at the downtown sites along the railroad tracks. Uh, the old Kinko's building site and the, where the site where the Workers' Resource Center is. We're currently evaluating uh, proposals and deciding what kind of development would be appropriate for those sites. Don't worry, all the parking that's there will be replaced and more. We're going to add 300 spaces for downtown's use on those sites. Hillsdale Mall renovations will be finished with a luxury cinema, a bowling alley, entertainment center, and a new outdoor dining terrace for all to enjoy by the end of 2018. San Mateo remains a food mecca with recent eateries like Tin Pot and Blue Bottle opening at Bay Meadows and Rome Burger in downtown. And I'm especially excited about the Worst Hall, which is a German-Austrian style beer hall uh, from Kenji Lopez Alt, who I understand is a well-renowned uh, uh, chef. And um, it's going to open in February in the downtown right across the street from Trags at the corner of Baldwin and uh, B Street. So in conclusion, I want to mention upcoming community events and engagement opportunities. San Mateo is dedicated to protecting residents, investing in our long-term future, and working with other agencies to mitigate the issues of traffic and congestion. That said, the future San Mateo is bright, and with your help, we can make it brighter and greener. Mark your calendars for the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the city's adoption of the 101st Airborne Unit, the Screaming Eagles. They'll be here over the weekend of March 23rd through 25th. You can join events like working out with the soldiers, attend the private, the parade, attend the parade downtown. It's not private. It's open to everybody. Festival in Central Park following the parade and purchase tickets to a gala banquet. Uh, and you can check out the city's website for more information. There are also opportunities to buy dinner for a soldier. So anybody who wishes to go ahead and there are different uh, I th levels, I think, for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. You can buy a meal for a soldier. And we're going to have about 50 of them here. And if you want to volunteer, volunteerism is one of the most important things that any city can have. 
and San Mateo is doing a great job. We have our volunteer expert here, our leader in volunteers, Donna Devote, back there in the corner. And you'll see my favorite volunteer opportunity right now over there on that wall, Adopt a Drain, volunteer today. We're talking about storm drains. Storm drains can get clogged during the rainy season, and when they do, we can end up with local, uh, localized flooding at different intersections around town, and that can cause other problems. So we're hoping to do a, a couple of things, keep the water flowing, but also keep the plastic bottles. This weekend I picked up a whole bag full of styrofoam that was in front of one down here by Taco Bell. Um, I was out cleaning storm drains this weekend. Um, so it's a great thing to do. I really uh, uh, would encourage people to go to the volunteer source on sign, uh, online at the city's website. Look for something that you feel like you would like to do. It's a great feeling. I really enjoy it. And finally, please follow us and tweet, share with the city, um, like us, follow us on all of the, uh, the uh, social networking uh, apps that you see the logos for over there. And I want to add one last final personal note. I know that people are really concerned about the issue of building housing and about the, the, the number of cars on the street. And I want to say that these are things that have developed in San Mateo over the last 40 years. We have huge regional issues that are causing uh, 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 what we see on the freeways and it overflows onto our city streets. For many years, we built offices, employment, a lot of employment on this side of the bay while not really building sufficient housing for people to live in. The people who come here to work from the other side of the bay are the people who are clogging the bridge, getting off the freeway at the 101 and 92 intersection, driving around our streets. They're just trying to get to work, really. But um, uh, there is no magic wand. This is a regional issue. All nine Bay Area counties, 101 cities are experiencing this issue. Uh, so, just like the proverbial death by a thousand cuts you've heard of before, we need to get active and be positive. We need to seek success and achieve success through a thousand positive actions. Like I said, no magic wand. But there's a whole list. Actually, right now, if you go on the internet and you look at getusmoving.org, it's a county program, there, there's a list on there as one of the slides of about 20 different things that we're looking at doing that will help relieve this situation. I would encourage people to go look at that because there's some information there that if you haven't seen it, will give you some hope for the fact that over a period of time, if we continue to do all the right things, we will see relief from this situation. So that said, I want to thank you all for being here and I wanted to open it up for questions. Um, if anybody has any questions. Thank you all very much. So anybody wants to? Please, sir. And we have a microphone for you. Um, I want to ask about the, the county and, and Peninsula uh, Family Services Age-Friendly Cities Initiative. I didn't hear any mention about that. And I, I'd like to know what, if the city's committed to that and, and how they're organizing or what the plans are to support that. Thank you, it's a good question because we are experiencing the aging of many of the people in our population. The percentage of aging people is growing in San Mateo as it is in many other places. And I did attend the uh, uh, forum that was put on by the Peninsula Family Service down at the Prado Center. I had to leave a little early, I think I left around lunchtime. But I wanna say I met with Heather Cleary, the director of Peninsula Family Service just last week. And I'm definitely in favor of doing whatever we can to make this city a more senior friendly city. And I know there are many different specific measures that have been called out, different things we can do. I'm committed to making that, some of those things at least, a reality. They're going to help make this a better place for our seniors to be able to get about safely and efficiently uh, uh, without having undue barriers and hurdles to overcome. Thank you for the question. Right there, yeah. We'll get over here in a minute. Hi, Mayor Bonilla, could you give us more details on the status of the downtown plan and what's coming up with that? Okay, status of the downtown plan is the question. Uh, we've had a series of forums. We had some that were workshops in this very room and we had other ones that were taste and talk, uh, basically lectures with slides informing people about different things that can be done in downtowns. Right now, we have pretty much run our course with that. We're embarking on the city's general plan. The downtown plan will be folded into the general plan. 
The general plan is a much larger plan that, that actually forms an outlook right now through 2040. And uh, uh, we're seeking lots of public input. There will be many public meetings. We're hoping to get people to come from all the different neighborhoods and all the different walks of life to provide us with your ideas, your hopes, your dreams for what we can do in San Mateo to be a better uh, public serving city and one that is able to grow into the future without some of the issues we're experiencing right now. The general plan is about finding ways to overcome some of the issues we're facing right now. Thank you. Next. My next time. Hi, I'm Mike Nash, um, and I wanted to confirm that your presentation will be on the website. Yes, it will. And follow up information on particular programs, like the, I'm very interested in the electric charger program, but the level of detail wouldn't be appropriate tonight. I assume you can see that on the website? Yeah, okay, so this presentation will be on the website and you can find all sorts of other information. And I'm gonna ask somebody to actually, if somebody can let us know where you can find information about the city's electric chargers that are available uh, around town. Does anybody have, can somebody make some, Kathy please, make some comments about that. Um, so there's several places. So we do have a downtown parking website that has the locations of our chargers in all the various city parking garages. Um, we currently have them in three locations in the downtown, as well as we have a sustainability page, which is off of the city manager's website, which has a lot of information on the various sustainability programs that we're um, looking into as the city. I want to say that we also have a sustainability commission that meets once a month, as long as they have agenda items. Right? We have an existing climate action plan. You can look up the climate action plan on the website. And, um, and it's a very proactive climate action plan, but we're working this year on updating it and making it better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then we'll let them have it for, okay. Just for those of you who live in Baywood, the Homeowners Association is having its annual meeting on February 11th at the Baywood School and the general plan and the update to the downtown plan are on the agenda. And Ron is, uh, Ron Munakawa is going to be speaking. There's there. Ron, yeah. And it starts at two, so. Thank you very thank much. You. I, I just want to ask anybody who uses the microphone to please hold it up to your mouth because when you hold it like this, it doesn't work as well. Yeah, I, I want to thank the city for the work that it's doing in uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions. It's uh, very, very important uh, to me. Um, last summer, the county came out with a, vulner a sea level vulnerability assessment. Um, and um, in light of that, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the wastewater treatment project, um, its cost, and uh, what's going on with that, uh, the mm -hmm. progress on that. Mm -hmm. So I can try a little bit. I also have uh, Kathy Zamet here who I can call on to try and fill in uh, some of the blanks that I may leave. But uh, our clean water program is basically a $900 million program that will stop our sanitary sewer overflows. It will bring us into compliance with the cease and desist order that the state issued in 2009 to stop having sanitary sewer overflows. It will improve our plant and our collection system so that we can handle the increased flows that come during winter storms. Because what happens is in our city, in many places, we have older sewer laterals. Many of them are terracotta pipes. Some are Orangeburg. I know this is probably more than most people want to know. But they crack, they break. And as soon as that happens in soil that's full of storm water, that water just shoots right into there like it's being sucked in. We end up with our wastewater treatment plant, which normally sees 12 or 13 million gallons a day of water coming to it, receiving suddenly 60 million gallons a day. It's a lot for it. The old, it's aging, it's, it's um, uh, outdated. The, it's, it's discharge doesn't meet modern requirements. So there are a lot of reasons why we need to do it. It's a $900 million improvement plan. It's going to expand our collection system. It's going to expand our sewage and tremendously modernize our wastewater treatment plant. We will eliminate nutrient discharge into the Bay. That's a great thing. No other jurisdiction in the Bay Area is doing that. We're going to make a big difference. We're setting the bar higher. And when we were in Washington, D.C. last week talking to the Environmental Protection Agency, they were very impressed with our plan. And I feel very optimistic that we're going to get help uh, from them in the form of a low interest loan that I mentioned earlier when I spoke. Currently, the, the interest on that loan, which will fund up to 49% of a project, uh, will be, it's less than 3%. It could go up by the time we actually, you know, uh, uh, if we get approved. But um, it's a great thing. 
Um, and if you have any other questions, I'll see if I can get Kathy to come up and talk about them. Do you have specific questions or do you have specific questions? North Shore flood protection? The North Shore view and North Central District uh, um, are, are right now subject to, they're on the FEMA flood map and they need some improvements. There's a piece of levee north of Coyote Point going towards Burlingame, needs to be improved somewhat. And there are two pump stations in low lying lands there that are designed to pump any storm flood water that may get over the levee uh, back out into the bay. They're outdated, we're replacing them and we're gonna improve that levy. Um, and uh, uh, the people right now basically are gonna be voting in, in, in their own district on a flood assessment district to be able to assess themselves where I think it's about 10% of the cost of doing the work. The rest will most likely, or the city will, will come up with the funding to do it. It's something we need to do to get the people out of the FEMA flood zone so they can stop buying very expensive flood insurance and protect them. A man here in green, and then the lady here, and then the lady there. Quick question. Is there any interest, Mr. Mayor, of bringing BART down to San Mateo or beyond? So this is a question that's been around for a long time. And uh, it went away there for a long time. And now that we're experiencing the transportation crush that we're seeing, uh, the train is full, though we're electrifying it, Right now, it's like I see sometimes, sometimes I stop just to watch what's going on at the station. When the doors open, a few people get off and a bunch of people are trying to get on with bikes and everything else. It's full going in either direction. And so that's why the electrification is gonna be a great thing. Instead of having five cars in each train, there will be six. Um, and instead of running five times an hour, it will run six times an hour. And the ridership could go from the current around 60,000 a day to around 100,000 a day. So that said, do I think that's enough? No. I think we do need to look at additional mass transit. And I think looking at connecting BART from Millbrae to where it's gonna terminate in San Jose or someplace in Santa Clara County is a very important thing to look at. I don't think we can take any transit options off the table right now. So yes, I, I think, and, and I definitely support looking at that. I have two questions. Um, one, there's a fire station on the corner of Alameda and Barnison that they're talking about moving. Um, what's gonna happen with the land up there? Um, and then I have a second question, so I'll let you answer that one first, then I'll ask my second question. Okay, regarding the land, George, do you know exactly what the plan is for that? I mean, I spoke with the chief, and it's my understanding it will be surplus land and we'll probably sell it, so. I think if I heard the question correctly, it was about Fire Station 25. The fire, new fire Station, station 25, 25, corner of Barnison and Alameda. So it, it, when we open the new station and the firemen move over, what will be done with that land? Yeah, I, I don't know what the disposition of the existing station yeah. is. That's yeah. really not our part of, of, yeah. of the process. Our part is the yeah. development of the new station. Yeah. So I'm not sure about the disposition of the, of the existing I'm sorry. Station. I'm going to get the answer for you. I'd like you to email me, and I'll respond to you. Sure. Um, so, you know, as we make codes and there's different codes that you guys pass, um, I've been having some issues with code enforcement and I'm wondering if there's any um, plans to expand code enforcement hours or staff because it's limited to Monday through Friday, like eight to five, and sometimes things happen on the weekends. And so I'm just trying to get a sense for plans. We have George to answer that question. Uh, no current plans for expansion, though we're certainly open to suggestion. Okay, so include that on your email. Yeah, yeah, I'll be happy to uh, carry that forward and ask some questions about it and see what I can do. Okay, other questions, anybody? Well, okay, then I guess everything must be great. In this. Okay, Adam, go ahead. Well, of course, first I just want to thank you for giving the city the an opportunity to engage with you on plans for 2018. Uh, I was just kind of curious because you gave a very quick intro in the beginning a little bit about yourself. Um, and, I, and I think when we saw these slides, it, it, rec it discussed uh, priorities that the city is taking. Um, but I, I guess I just wanted to ask what your priorities might be um, more specifically and, and what do you think this year will we'll hold for the city of San Mateo that, that will allow people to take away and say, yeah, this was 
what uh, San Mateo did under a Rick Bonilla mayorship, for example? Like, what, what, what are you especially excited about um, re regarding some of what you uh, showed us? And is there anything, you know, uh, that you think will be uh, different uh, with you as mayor than with others? Thank you. Well, you know, for me, I have a passion about the issues that are really dogging us, housing and transportation. Housing is something that, uh, uh, and transportation, they go together. You can't talk about one without talking about the other. People are, some people think we already have too much housing and we should stop building. Uh, but I know that you can't stop building because we have so many jobs here that if we stop building, we would literally, and I have a question for anybody that says that. Do you think that if we just stopped building today, that all the cars that are on the road out there now would just disappear? That we would go back to the way it was 10 years ago? No, of course it wouldn't happen. No. But we need to, at the same time, while we provide much needed housing for people, and it has to be efficient housing in the right places, where it's accessible to transit. The train, uh, 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 the bus on El Camino, um, the freeway, on and off ramps, whatever. It has to be someplace where it makes sense to build it, not just anywhere. We can't just build, and we need some heights and we need some densities. For years, we've been, we've been having limits on our heights and densities that, that I think have really kept us from doing what we need to do. And they could actually be, in San Mateo, part of the reason why we have some of the issues that we have with traffic and lack of housing, very high cost of housing. We have some of the highest cost of housing in the country and indeed I think in the world right here in San Mateo County um, and I can describe specific uh, cases but it's crazy most people who work let's say you work at the bank and you're not the vice president you can't afford to live here you work at the library okay and uh, I mean I think maybe even the top level employee here at the library can't really afford to buy a new house here in San Mateo and it's hard to rent a place I saw recently where one-bedroom apartments are going for nearly $3,000 a month. Okay? So we have to do something about that. At the same time, though, we can't stop and not do anything about transit. We need tremendous mass transit improvements. We need to get people from here to there, wherever they're going, in fewer vehicles. So now, besides the train and besides your car and besides buses, there are also rideshare platforms. There's something that I've been a member of the board on. I just left it this year because I appointed another council member. But it's called commute.org. It's the Peninsula Traffic Congestion Relief Alliance. If somebody goes on there and enters their information about where they live and where they work, it will tell you who lives near you and who works near there that you could get a ride with. Okay? You could share a car. It costs less. Uh, it's more efficient because you get to go into the commuter lane. And it's much less stressful. And, and it's, it's affordable. Right now, we have a million dollar grant. I say we, I'm off the board. But anyway, there's a million dollar grant that came from the county transportation uh, department that's subsidizing each ride by $2 a ride. So it's an incentive to get people out there to try it. Think about this. On Columbus Day or Martin Luther King Day, when not everybody goes to work, but a bunch of people still do. Some people take the day off. For some reason, the freeways are suddenly traversable. You can get from here to there in a reasonable amount of time. And if you think about it, most people are still going to work, but it eliminated 5 or 10% of the cars that are normally out there, and it made a huge difference. That's all we need to do. If we can get enough people to share a car with somebody, along with the train and the other things we're doing, we could make a huge difference. Take a look at commute.org. Any Let's other call questions? for any other questions. Here we go. Again. I like this guy. <laughs> so, you know, in my opinion, the um, resolution to the traffic problem is going to require more infrastructure. That's correct. And I'm wondering, do you think there's any stomach for putting in something like a monorail that traveled north-south? So it's bridge? an idea I've heard before. Um, uh, uh, th I, like I said, take no idea off the table right now, okay? Because anything we can do that's going to help needs to be examined for viability. Um, uh, let me just tell you right now, the 101 and 92 improvements that are being looked at 
I saw uh, a presentation the other day that said, well, they should cost anywhere between 15 and 160 million dollars. That's a pretty wide range. You know, I'm thinking to do what we need to do to get cars actually moving there, it's going to cost a lot more than 15 million in today's dollars, right? Uh, and construction is in a very high cycle right now. Construction projects are costing money. Um, so I'm thinking, no, it's more like 100, 125, 150 million. It'll happen at some point in the future because it has to happen. That intersection. And, and so then there's something called the Regional Measure 3, which is looking at raising tolls on the bridges to help jurisdictions that are suffering from overflow impacts from the bridge do things that are going to reduce and mitigate those impacts. So Mutual Measure 3 talks about raising the tolls on the bridge possibly as much as $3, right? Which is, somebody might think, well, that's not a lot of money. But if you're a person who's working here at the minimum wage and, and you live over in, in Tracy because you can't afford the rent until you get out there, it makes a big difference. So that's why I say we have to look closely at everything and think about the equity as well as, as the practicality. Anything else? Okay. If that's it, then I guess the meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much.